I am here today to talk about objects, to talk about things. So since the time we were born, since the time we were children, we've always been interacting with various objects, various things. And all these things have, have been giving us great experiences. I mean, think of it. The time that you got a new two-wheeler and it had a new key, you were very attentive towards what experience you got, uh, got from the key. And you were very attentive while using it. And you didn't want to spoil it. And you just wanted to last, uh, you, did, you just wanted it to last long. But once you use objects for a long time, you get used to them. Like the spoon. Do you remember the last time you thought while using a spoon? I mean, it's very subconscious. It's very hard-coded within us to use objects. So the thing is, objects tell us stories. Objects communicate with us. Now, how do they do that? I mean, now let's all consider for a second that we do not know what a hairdryer is. You've never seen a hairdryer, and you've never used a hairdryer. And I give you one. So when I give you a hairdryer, you look at it. You'll still know how to hold it. You'll still know how to switch it on. You'll still know how to increase and decrease the intensity, all without having used it before. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? So that's, that's just how products communicate with us. They tell us stories. And when we interact with these products, they give us experiences. Speaking of experiences, imagine all of us were in this very important meeting, and it's a boardroom, and this, this very important conference is going on. And there is this one point that is very important, and we just have to write it down. Now, to write it down, you pull out your pen, and you press the button. So when you press the button, you hear this click, and you feel the click in your hands. But imagine this time, this click doesn't happen. So probably something is wrong with the spring, but you don't hear the click, and you don't feel the click. So when that happens, you know something is wrong with the pen. And your experience of the entire meeting is spoiled by something as small as a pen. Now let's talk about larger experiences. So in 1964, AT&T came up with this concept, with this idea in a video, and they said that we one day will have a video phone with which you could not only talk to someone and listen to someone, but you could see someone who is far, far away from you. And that was an amazing idea. But incidentally, they were not the first to have that idea. Many people have had, had that idea. I mean, the Jetsons spoke about it. The same idea was in uh, many of our fairy tales, where you could pull out mirrors, and you could see someone through that mirror, and you could talk to them. But this came to fruition when Steve Jobs announced iPhone 4, which had, uh, which had the FaceTime app, with which he called someone on stage, and he did it. Now it is a commercially viable product, and all of us have that in our pockets. I mean, think of it. Since the time we were skinning deers and wearing their skins as loincloths around us, we've now come to this. We have this product in our pockets. That's amazing. It's marvelous how far we've come. But before this product came in, before this object came in which could do this, what it was, was a good idea. It was an amazing idea to connect to someone who was so far away. And the thing about good ideas is, they increase the quality of life, and they add value to your life. So another thing about good ideas is, they're as feasible as they're fantastic. Think about it. If, only, if the idea were only feasible, it would just be redundant, just another product, like the pen. But if it were fantastic, and only fantastic, it would be something from the dreams and something that is not feasible. So an idea needs to be a blend of both these. So now I'm going to talk about how I came up with a few of these ideas and how I translated them into different products and objects. So let's talk about lemons. So if you see lemons, when you squeeze them with your hands, you essentially do it sideways. But you squeeze it with a lemon squeezer, and you go top to bottom. And if you compare their outputs, the one with the hand has better output, and not all juice is extracted from the one which, which comes from the lemon squeezer. You end up using your hands even after using the lemon squeezer. Here I had two questions. One, if we've made a machine to extract juice, why does it not extract it completely? And second, if we do it sideways with our hands, why does the machine do it top to bottom? Now, based on this, I was fueled to make my own iteration of a lemon squeezer, which looks like this. So I used sideways squeezing in this one. And if you can see, 
the output of my machine, which I call Citro, is very similar to that of your human hand. Now here, it uses the, technic the technique that is used by our hands, that is sideways squeezing, and it is paired with uh, the machine that uh, paired with the strength that is given by the machine. And this is how I could come up with the product. It was just simple observation of lemons that were in front of me. But what about things that are more ta intangible, which you can't see in front of you? How do you design for them? So when I was in the final year of my college, that was just last year, I came up with this industrial design initiative with two of my classmates. And I call it Quip. So as the name says, we wanted to make witty, interesting, smart products. Not necessarily smart in terms of technologically advanced, but they must be witty to use. At that time, I got a brief from Japan, and it was for a competition, and they had asked for entries from all around the world. And the brief was, we had to bring back the kimono culture to the youth of Japan. At that point of time, none of us had been to Japan, and we just knew what the kimonos were. They were these elegant uh, dresses that were worn by, worn by Japanese traditionals. But we didn't know what the youth of Japan looked like. So we used the resource that is available to all of us, the internet. So we got to know that these people are extremely addicted to technology. They use cell phones and tablets way more than we do. We also got to know that there is a big trend culture in Japan. So for example, if something were to become famous in Japan, you see it everywhere from cell phone covers to people wearing their, uh, wearing their costumes in stadiums and in malls to the TV advertisements about them, it's just everywhere. It's just a trend. So we wanted to tap into exactly this. Then we had a look at the kimono, this very traditional, elegant dress that is worn by them. So if you see both the cultures, we had to have an exact melange of them, youth and tradition. But they are very disparate cultures. They are very away from each other. So how do we do it? Then we had a look at the kimono in detail. This is the kimono. And we asked ourselves, what makes a kimono a kimono? Or what is the kimono-ness of a kimono, if I may call it that? So we understood it is this fold that is on the front that makes it the kimono. I remove the fold, and it looks like just another robe or just another gown. At that time, I had these earphones which had to be folded on my ear in order to wear them. So that's when the connection struck us, and we came up with the kimono phones. Now, the kimono phones are earphones which need to be worn around your ear in the exact same way that you wear the kimono around your body. And if you see it from any of the angles, they resemble the kimono to a great extent. And they are electronic products, so we thought the Japanese would like them. And also they are stylish wearables, so they might just become a trend in Japan. And thankfully the Japanese thought so too, and we were placed amongst the winning five entries that came to Tokyo Designers Week last year. And <laughs> thank you. So that's it. We, we hadn't been to Japan, but we observed. And through our observations, we came up with something like this. Now, this was conscious observation. We wanted to work on lemons, so we worked on lemons. We wanted to work on kimonos, so we focused our attention to that. But that, is, that doesn't happen all the time. I mean, you, uh, sometimes these observations are very subconscious. So what do you think this is? This is a product we made earlier this year. It has an S and P on it and two buttons on it. So probably it has something to do with salt and pepper, right? But at the same time, it's not on the dining table. It's, it has stationery surrounding it. So let me tell you, it is a product that we call Spepper. And it is a stapler and a punching machine put together. Now, subconsciously, all of us know that a stapler and a punching machine is used by the same kind of people. And it, it is used in the same kind of environments. So it would be fun to join them together. Now, not being technical experts, we didn't reinvent any of the products. We just realigned the product in a nice, beautiful box that would look nice on your table. And that's how we got Spepper. Now, interestingly, as Quip, we were also placed in the best 300 designs that came from all around the world earlier this year in International Forum of Design, the IF Design Awards, uh, in March of this year. Now, if you'd see one thing, that we are not technical experts in anything. We've not learned technology, but we're just big fans of technology. What we did essentially in all this was we observed. And from these observations, we came up with inferences, the most relevant conclusions from our observations, and we made. Now, what I did not tell you in this talk 
was the immense number of wrong lemon squeezes that I made and the amount of folds that we tried out in paper and from these folds we picked the one which resembled the kimono the most and that's how we came up with it. Speaking about making, we've always been making, right? As humankind, we've always been making. The first tool that we made for hunting and for farming, we discovered fire, we invented the wheel and since then we haven't stopped. Humankind has always been curious and we've always wanted to make new amazing things to get new amazing experiences. And I really believe that there is an inventor, a discoverer in all our hearts. We can all design, we can all make, we can all invent. I mean, think about it. When you were children, you'd play with Legos and you would draw drawings. But then through that, you'd not only talk about your experiences, you'd not only tell stories, but you would create entire worlds and they were yours. So I really believe everyone can invent and everyone can, be, uh, every can, everyone can discover and design. And I want to try to prove just that everyone can do it. Now what I'm going to do now is very interesting. So I'm going to place two situations in front of you, you guys. And when you look at those situations, and when I explain those two situations to you, you are all going to design. And I'm sure you are all going to be able to come up with new amazing objects or systems or ways to do things. So are you ready? Yes. So here goes situation number one. This is a vertical window pane, very simple. But the thing about it is, uh, it is either open or it is shut. So in order to keep it halfway open, someone has a place to salt shaker over there. Now, can you think of a new object which would help you keep it at the exact level which you want it? Can you make something of cardboard maybe, or something made of wood, or maybe a groove in the window itself, or maybe some object that is available in the market? Can something be done to this? And if we apply our brains to it and think of it just a little, I'm sure we'll all be able to come up with situations, right? And come up with amazing solutions to this. Now, I'm giving you another situation. Imagine the building you're in, it catches fire. And there's panic, and you're all running. And while running, you come across this switch. This switch has lift flap, press button written on it. Now in all that panic, and everyone's running, and in all that chaos, would you really stop, read this, lift up the flap, and then press the button? And imagine, uh, consider that this building doesn't have enough fina finances for fire alarms. Would you really, uh, I mean, would you, uh, it doesn't have enough uh, finances for the sensors. So what would you do? Can you come up with a design that would be a nice option to this, which would be placed better somewhere? So in conclusion, I'd like to say that there is an inventor, a discoverer, a designer in all of us. And when we put our hearts to it, we can really all come up with amazing new experiences. So let's have good stories for people to tell. Thank you.